a lot of those districts stay alive because of the personalities that are in them. Yeah. And if you start losing those personalities or somebody sells and then it's bought by an institution or whatever, and the in- institutions, they don't think about it, but they're making a big bet that they can they can manufacture what somebody has made it their life. And when those things start going away, like it just stops feeling as special. Right. And then then it's literally like just a regular old uber expensive mixed use deal that, you know, nobody can afford and nobody wants to go to the tenants because it feels dead. Susan, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. For those listening, Susan and I have known each other for 19 years. We were both freshmen at TCU together. You started the real estate club, but I got some credit for it. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you for that's, that. That's typical with how things went. But that's you. You kind of have always just taken the ball and run with it. Yeah. Um, and then you like got the credit somehow. People give me a lot of credit, but I, I try and deflect as much. I'm like, they did it all. I was just around the hoop. Um, no resentment here. But it's good to be around the hoop, I guess, yeah. every now and again. Yeah, for sure. Um, why don't we pick up where we were just talking? Okay. We're in a weird world of fundraising. What has been like your experience in trying to raise capital? Just like conversations, like where's the market at? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, there's, there's really... I've started thinking about cat, which this seems intuitive, but it's not whenever you're feeling your way through it and like learning as you go. And then once you get to the end of it, you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, you know, I've been thinking about capital in really three different ways. One's our GP capital, second's our LP capital, and third is our opco capital. Um, you know, for us, opco capital is just um self funded by Jessica and I. So we've not uh topped that bucket on the uh LP side. Um, historically we've gone from, you know, when we very first started 19 friends and family investors to, you know, family office investment to some institutions and then some mixture in between. Um, and you know, I'll kind of say where we've, where we've been over the last, um, uh, call it 18 months. And as of recent on, on the LP side and then on the GP side, um, you know, typically that's been, um, historically self-funded or then syndicated GP capital. Um, at the beginning of this year, um, we decided to raise a GP fund that would allow for, um, you know, one vehicle for our GP investors to invest in that would allow to give them access to all of our deals. Um, uh, that was my first time, um, and still is, it's still ongoing right now. My first time raising, Um, a fund. And um, it's been an interesting time to do it. Um, I think a couple of themes have popped out of it from like a human behavior perspective. Um, Humans are weird. I know. God. (laughs) (laughs) Including us. I know. Right. Um, uh, Probably, you know, the first one, and since it's, it's, we've been raising since February. So there's been, if you think about where we were in February, um, and even when we were, you know, getting prepared to to launch, quote unquote, um, you know, we had a, the market was way, way more opaque than it is today. Yeah. So we encountered different challenges through the fundraise. So call it February through April. Um, you know, we're more we were more pitching about, um, uh, you know, is it are we going to see three caps again? You know, that type of stuff, which, you know, for the record, I, you know, I wasn't the one saying we're going to see three caps again. <laughs> Sad, but <laughs> I know that's not going to happen. Um, uh, maybe whenever um, Elliot's older, like that'd be great. Yeah. Whatever. Um, She's going to start three cap capital. Right. Yeah. Be badass. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you can say whatever you want. All right, cool. Uh, uh, so, so the pitch was different then. And so then we had investors interested um, because for a couple of things, one, it was our first fund. And typically we've raised on GP side, it's basically been GP LP capital on a syndicated basis. So our GP investors receive the same um, the same return um, and waterfall structure that our majority LP did. Um, that's what we had typically had done. Um, with the way we're raising the GP fund, um, this allowed those typical investors that typically invested in every single one of our deals, but had discretion to say yes or no to each one, like almost 600 basis points of movement between, you know, the old deal structure, which was a, you know, basically you're a baby LP um, that gets that's the same um, economics as the majority LP, but you're on the GP side um, versus being on a GP investor in the GP fund, which allows for, you know, project level returns for plus a piece of promote. So, um, 
and the technically the right possibly to be an LP if they want. Yes, yes. Um, and, and increase the size of their amount. Yeah. Um, with that being said, the, in the early days of um, uh, uh, like ferreting through that, a lot of people were very interested. Um, they were re getting comfortable with changing the way that they were um, investing with us, which was from again, discretion to non-discretion. Um, and then there also was a lot of dialogue around like, where are we? Like when, when is this going to deploy all that type of stuff? So that was, those were, it was a different set of challenges. Um, and then, um, as you know, we've had a S ton of, um, just pricing discovery and it's still ongoing right now from, I mean, even before then, but, yep. um, and so, um, you know, we've been in, um, fundraising, but we've had to be, we have, we've had to change like our yield requirements in our fund deck, you know, like yeah. three or four times. We're like, crap, shit. <laughs> Quit going up. I know. <laughs> We're like, dang it. I thought I was conservative on that. Um, <laughs> and then um, uh, the hardest piece is now, you know, there was the there was the um, potential for distress in call it 12 months when we were in January, February. Um, and now we're people are starting to see it. Um, it's not, you know, hugely prevalent, but we've seen it in one off cases. And then obviously we all know what math. Uh, what math problem was done literally 18 months ago that now no longer works that a lot of deals were sh- struck at. Um, and so um, now the challenge is more around um, competing against distress or the perception of distress. Yep. Opportunity cost. Yeah, exactly. And as an investor, do I want to invest in um, a fund where I'm saying yes to, you know, quote unquote, yes to everything. The, the positive with the GP fund is you're really only giving yourself, you know, five to 20% exposure to any one deal. So yep. in theory, you're diversified more. Um, but, um, you're, you're still thinking, or do I hold all my capital back so I can wait for somebody that really has a distress deal and, you know, load all my capital into that. Um, um, and then you have a lot of investors right now that are like, okay, do I even want to put it with a sponsor? Yeah. Do I want to keep it? I'm going to do it direct. Um, and so, uh, raising the GP fund has been super challenging for a number of different reasons. I mean, it's been quote unquote successful in you know, what it needed to do, but it's been a, a pretty big slugfest for sure. Um, and I've learned a lot. And then on the LP side, um, I would say that's probably been more challenging. Um, if you can really say it that way, um, we've had some really great, um, LP partners, like awesome LP partners. Um, but uh, the the well, we'll see if we have to delete this or not. But um, <laughs> you know, the 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 um, one, you know, on the more just kind of taking a step back, the the opportunity set that they see is very different than the opportunity set that you and I see. So when they are, what do you mean by that? So when they are. Um, when I'm pitching to our LP partner, uh, whatever, it's a, uh, okay, I can get to a seven and a half yield on costs on an untrended on industrial class. B. I mean, we all know the same economics um, or whatever. It's moved, you know, was freaking sick. You get my point. Yeah. Um, um, but they're also in the same investment committee. You know, that guy's pitching that deal to his, um, the rest of uh, his partners. And at the same time, they're getting three distress pitches on the other side. Yeah. And so they can't help but like it's not and it really shouldn't be an and um uh, an or conversation but sometimes it is especially in ic yeah um and so uh uh that that has been a challenge um is one competing against the perception of distress or just um candidly um you know if we take a very focused approach to the real estate investing we do which is a good thing but a lot of our institutional partners are in multiple asset classes, mul- multiple different types of structures. So they just have a they have they have a larger lens to what other opportunities are out there that, they're, that, that they are competing or putting it up against. So that's that's one that's more like the nice, nice way to put it. Um, the second way to put it is, you know, we're, you know, just just naturally who I am. I'm I'm here to build wealth um, and, uh, um, you know. I'm totally fine being the first guy. Like I don't really want to be like the fifteenth guy. Most of our what do you mean? Most of our LP institutional partners they don't want to. They want to wait till everybody's been like the water's fine. Oh right, come on out. It's safe. Um, they and, come in when prices are high. They're right. out when prices are low. You're like man, no. 
Yeah. Um, which <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, you know, there's it's like finding that balance. Um, and if you can get a really, which again, we're blessed with really good partners. If you can get a really great partner that you can have that dialogue with, like, okay, here's where I think we are, but no one's going to be a hundred percent right. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think it's been good. The the issue lately over the last um, eight to 10 months is even with really great partners, um, yield requirements have moved so quickly that even if you're on the same page with, you know, an institutional partner, literally, I mean, mid deal, the yield requirements can change. Yep. Um, and, you know, for groups that are structured like us, the sponsors, we're the ones on the front line, like negotiating and it, it, it makes it challenging. Um, especially when, um, there's been a bid ask spread for a while and that gap is closing, but then, you know, the benchmark keeps moving for a reason because rates keep moving and then you're constantly trying to, you know, catch it up. So on the LP side, it's been, it's been, um, a challenge for sure. And then the other piece of it, you know, that's, and that's related to capital raising, um, I'd say the other piece of it is, um, we're lucky that we have a ton of groups, um, that we would like to work with and they would like to work with us. The challenge is finding the right deal at this point, given, um, a couple things. One in our business, we see a lot of, you know, smaller deals, um, that are call it 10 million equity checking down and, you know, forming a new relationship. You really need a larger check size to do that. Most likely. How much are you hearing? Because a lot of the groups that you talk to are either like already committed funds or they're big yeah. institutions that in theory, like have to put out capital at some yeah. point. They can't like not invest for yeah. the next 10 years. Yeah. Are you getting any sense that like the animal spirits are building like we haven't put yeah. money out? I mean, anybody listening it's, to this is not in real estate. This window started drying up. We're now a year and yeah. two, three months into this. Yeah. Um, I would say they're they're still um, keeping it close to the vest, but um, I, I'm starting to hear some analytic um, commentary, uh, you know, for first quarter, second yeah. quarter. Yep. Um, of 2024. I, who knows where rates are going? But it yeah. feels like we've kind of yeah. hit our our top. Yeah. At least that's yeah. kind of. I the, mean, I'd love, I'd love. I think rates will go back down to like in the four and a half range, which sounds freaking awesome to me. I'm great with that normalized level at some point. Um, and when that ho happens, I hope well, I will have purchased an S ton of real estate. You know, I wish I would have already been purchasing a lot, but it's been super challenging. And as we know, um, debt is another thing that's been super difficult lately. But um, through the next, you know, call it 12, 18 months, because I think, you know, we will see, we won't see what we saw in, 2020 to end of 2021, but we will see, you know, obviously value appreciation from rates not going the other way. I mean, our real estate portfolios, um, our real estate portfolio is, I mean, depends on the deal, but um, pricing could be corrected 40% off the top. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the flip side to that is, and I don't know exactly your portfolio, but we have some of the same stuff. The fundamental ground game has been yeah, has remained insane. strong. Rents are it's still insane. going up. Vacancy is still low. It's just the math equation. Yep. It's just yeah. the math equation. Yeah. Which is so irritating when you're a, um, you know, Jessica and I are just, we're just real estate people. Yep. We're not, I mean, yes, you've we're always been, been real estate, estate people. Person, so I'm like, it. this is the same, this is the same asset it was 18 months ago, you know, um, that, that part is, uh, tough. And then, so, you know, and then I have that, I have that conversation with our partners, you know, the math will change. You kind of have said it, but why did you choose to, why did you choose a GP fund? Like what was the um, aha moment? Uh, a, a couple, a couple of reasons why, um, from an, from an efficiency stand, I'll speak to, I'll speak on both sides. One from like our side, why we did it. And two, why I think it's better for the investor. Cause you know, we're going to be invested tremendously on our side. Um, uh, from our, our perspective, one from an efficiency perspective. So um, when you're fundraising GP capital, which again, on a $10 million deal where you're 10% of the co investors, that's a million bucks. And say so you've got whatever, four or five guys in it. You, you've got to be thinking, you know, even for those investors, where do those investors want me spending my time? Do they want me talking on the phone to them about their, um, like how their dentist appointment was? I mean, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. And I'm trying to be rude. It's so true. Um, oh. I, uh, you know, exactly. Well, um, a lot of rich old people don't have much going on. I they know. just want to sit and chat. <laughs> I know. And I'm like, I'm, my hair's on fire. Uh, I, I must go. Um, <laughs> um, so there's, so there's, 
there's that piece of it from an efficiency standpoint. Then from a reporting standpoint, you know, I've even noticed um, in our own, own our own shop, um, because we do have a lot of majority LP capital, um, our GP investors are equal as important, but because they're not getting daily updates or weekly updates like our majority LP, you know, they're getting, you know, quarterly re- quarterly yeah. reporting. You really, in an ideal world, you aggregate that into one report because, you know, the magnitude of the information they need to know, um, especially if they're invested in multiple deals, is very different. And there's so much, as you know, that goes on at the individual property level, like on a day to day basis for a minority GP investor, like getting them into the minutia. And once you bring it, it's just like anything else. If I start telling you about something, you want to know more about it, more about it, more about it. And so it's just also from a reporting efficiency standpoint and then just a, a quality of service in general. Yeah. And then the last piece is just, you know, where we're going. Um, and really overall, back to what I was talking about, like on Opco Capital, GB Capital, LP Capital. Um, uh, my time now, uh, which again, it's it's more trial by trial and error, just like in every other job I've had at this company, um, uh, is around how can we, you know, be, I say to the team, climb the next stair tread. Um, yeah. and just be more efficient and optimize more of our capital base. And so the GP GP side was was, you know, a very obvious next step for us. In addition to that, I mean, you never know where that takes you, but um uh, and I don't know that we'll ever actually do like a full LP fund or anything like that, but you definitely aren't gonna do it unless you've done fund one. Yeah. Um, and the way we report our returns is the same way y'all report y'all's returns. Yes, it's on a deal by deal basis, but our track record is everything. And so Um, I report our track record on a portfolio basis. That's the same. It's the same concept. Right. In just, uh, I have something written here um, that was an interesting fact. I didn't even have to read this to know this about you, but it said, (laughs) I have a strong skill in seeing data and identifying outliers. One thing I want to ask you a couple of things out of that thing, but is there any trends that you saw that there's this, there's the, um, the quote, if you've met one family office, you've met one family office. Uh-huh. But a lot of your investors, especially coming into the GP fund or family offices. Yeah. Is there any like trend you picked up on and like what matters to them versus maybe other investors that you've had in the past? Oh, man. Or is um, it all across the board? Uh, it's I mean, it's, it's probably all across the board, but I would say. Um, in general, you know, I think you deal with personalities with every investor group you work with, whether it's a you know institution or it's a family office, I think um, the family office dynamic is a, a little more personal. Um, and so the um, the things that they care about, is like in raising a GP fund, as example, is different than what if I'm on the phone with an institution talking about investing in the GP fund, which to be clear, we don't have any institutions that are investing in the GP fund. Yeah. Um, and so th- it, it's more about it's more of that, like um, much more about personality fit, um, who else is invested from, I mean, which the institutions are the same way. Yeah. Um, but you know, I wouldn't say that there's like one trend that popped out to me. That's like, okay. You guys, uh, over the last few years have kind of gotten into a, a similar market. We're kind of buying different stuff, but it's, yeah. it's under the class B category, yeah. Yeah. but you have taken an approach that we definitely have not taken, which is you are kind of making industrial cool a yeah. little more. We are not yeah. doing that stuff. Yeah. Where, where did that come from? Why are y'all doing that? How's, what, have, what is the data saying there? Well, yeah, I'd say there's a, a couple of things as it relates to, to certain whys behind why we started doing things when we did them. Yep. Um, so, you know, off, off the, the cool class B for a moment and thinking about, um, uh, class A development when before pre COVID, I think, I think we talked about this. Remember I brought you, we brought, I brought yeah, y'all a deal and I, I was like, this. Hey, we've got this hybrid um, this hybrid asset class, which, you know, what else is difficult? Making an asset class that doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes it very hard. Um, found that out later. Um, but we were talking about um, having industrial sites that had um, retail attributes, i.e., access, um, close, close proximity to rooftops, um, some level of showroom, some level of cons- consumer component. Um, and so we, you know, called it hybrid at the time we did an S ton of research and then um uh, uh started trying to we got a site which was our north quarter 35 site um which was land at the time there's some buildings on it um and started trying to pitch doing that which would have been more it's not as far as it you know went um but you know 
basically some retail component with huge industrial component on the back, but still like shallow bay, but a little bit cool, if you will. Um, and to refresh on that really quick, just so I and I remember this like it was yesterday. It was like, hey, um, Pottery Barn might have seven locations around DFW. Why not centralize this into one thing to where you can still show up shop, but you can just get it right out the back? Right. Or, something like that? Well, and, and from the retailer's perspective, the reason why you would have wanted to do it is so take a, a typical big city, say there's eight Pottery Barns or whatever. There's three that are badass, make them an us ton of money. The rest are exposure for them. Yeah. Um, and this is, again, pre us really being online shoppers. Yeah. Um, and so the concept was, OK, have your brand, your flagships, like you've got to have those, whether it's two or three. Um, but you don't, don't keep a lot of extra stuff there. And then have your centralized location where um, your warehouse is that you can also have a consumer component to it. And you can cut your real estate costs for all the retail that really is just you know, yeah. unoptimized and move it there. Um, that was the pitch to the retailers. Um, uh, but again, we were still, that was in the time when we were like, what's omni-channel? Like we were still trying to figure it out. Um, and then COVID happened and it obviously accelerated it. Um, we ended up doing with North, North Quarter 35, um, uh, basically a very, I'd say dumbed down version of that, which, you know, basically what we did on that asset um, was, it obviously, we're l lucky enough. I mean, it's an amazing site. I wish I could have 15 more of those sites, but that was a good deal. Uh, such a good site. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously had um, great frontage, very close to rooftops. It was one exit north of Alliance Town Center. Um, and then from a design perspective, tried to be a little bit more forward with the design, landscaping, et cetera, signage. Um, and then, you know, in our branding, you know, the other thing that you know, we're known for is our branding. If you look like our branding materials for our industrial stuff, it, yes. it's pretty, it's pretty sexy. For um, sure. and, and so that does stand out too. Um, but so all that, you know, that doesn't really cost really any, any, any other amount more in money than it would to pick. Okay. Instead of me picking a blue stripe, which I can't, I mean, how many industrial buildings have a blue stripe and you know, whatever you pick black, it's the same cost. Um, but, uh, it has made a difference in di differentiating our, differentiating our product. Yeah. Um, and so that was, that was one on the class B side. Um, we do very urban class B, so we don't do yeah. suburban class B and in an urban setting in class B, especially like sub markets that, um, I know we all love like GSW and Brook Hollow and Bowwood, you know, those are sub markets where you have, um, you know, smaller tenants that they, um, appreciate um more some of those type of you know whatever you want to call it cool components or we call it mojo like mojo components that i mean again cost the same amount of money um but um especially in a rising rate environment and um, not interest rate but rental rate i mean you're already you're already catching people on the up um and so your product is just you know they're already moving they're already having to move they're already having to okay I'm, my rent's already going from four to eight or whatever it is all right if it goes from four to nine but i get this um, so that's been good where it hasn't been successful or where, where it has been super successful is in markets where you're seeing bleed from other sub markets that are pushing tenants out, i.e. Brook Hollow design district. Those rents are getting too high. So then those tenants are coming to Brook Hollow. They're seeing our industrial product and saying, oh, you know, th this is actually a, a great brand expression for me, but it's industrial, but I'm still saving money somehow, but we're achieving a t above market rent for the yeah. sub market. <clears throat> where it hasn't been successful um, and thank God we haven't done it is um, in, in any type of commodity industrial or like big box type industrial. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we just haven't done any of that. Do you think the world is headed more in that direction? Are you, I, I, you probably pay attention to this more. Do you see other people designing kind of urban class B smaller base stuff like y'all are, or are you guys still at the tip of the spear? Uh, that's hard. I think, I think for us, um, there's the question, you know, it's, it's even, even internally for us, it's like a gut check. Like, you know, we'll get costs back. Like we're going to buy a building. We get costs back and, you know, our construction team's like, it's $60 a foot to do what you want to do. And you're like, no, yeah, no, we can't do it. And so like, you have to, um, the way we do it is challenging in that you like most groups aren't going to do it because if they just 
you know, say, look at our building and say, I want to do that storefront, that lighting, that landscaping, do that. It's generally going to come out more expensive. So nine times out of 10, every group's going to be like, no, I'm not doing it. Yeah. Um, and it's not even just that you have to layer that with like a, a, as, as you know, a very, um, hands-on approach to leasing and branding and marketing. Otherwise you've got a nice building, but nobody's talking about it. So So it's like super layered. Yeah. Um. So no, I don't think there's a ton of groups doing it because in industrial, as we know, it's been pretty easy to make money. For sure. Um. And are y'all getting higher rents because of it? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean we, I mean we haven't updated the stat in a while, but it's at least twenty five percent. That's awesome. Yeah. Shit, yeah. I might have to start. Yeah, it's buildings. hard though. Hard I know though. it's hard. It's y'all make hard. it look easy though. <laughs> no, it's super hard. Um. Yeah, I mean, we were kind of talking about that, going back to opportunity costs and everything. On that note, though, one thing that's become um, difficult for us as of recent, because um, uh, the market has done what the market has, we've been beat up more on market rent, um, on market rent assumptions in our underwriting more mm-hmm. than we have. And um, when we entered the last cycle, the way we were able to get aggressive very quickly is to be aggressive on our market rent assumptions, but we backed it up with, okay, we've got the mojo to make them there, but you have to make a bet that you can do it. Now we're in a, a market where we're seeing, um, especially on the institutional side, they're seeing deals across the country. They're seeing like inland empire rents like plummet. And so, um, what's happening is we're getting, um, not only are we getting, I want, whenever they're fact checking a deal, I want untrended yield on cost. Not only that, but I want to make sure that whatever rent you're including, there's nine comps to support it as opposed to before, you know, we could say, well, here's where the market is, but we feel really comfortable. We can hit two bucks higher. Um, and it makes it challenging, um, to get aggressive out in the market, which, you know, know, that's the other question. When's the time to be aggressive, but do you guys, uh, do you hire, um, a typical industrial broker? Or do you hire like a retail broker to lease this stuff? I hire a typical industrial broker. Okay. Yeah. And then you just kind of give them like, here's how you're going to talk about yeah. this space. This is yeah. a plan. This is a pitch. Archetype would have been an interesting one for us to talk about. Let's talk about it. Um, so archetype, We're right here right now. Yeah. <laughs> archetype was, or it is, it's a six building park in Brook Hollow, a flex product, Yeah. which there's like no flex product in Brook Hollow. Um, and, you know, average suite size ranges from five to 15,000. It was smaller than that. And then we kind of de, um, deflexed it a little bit, um, which again, alternate strategies there. Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, cause we tried to make suite sizes larger to oh, yeah. make it feel more like a light industrial with an attitude type, as opposed to leaning really flexy and keeping suite sizes at like 2,500 and really pushing rent that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, we, we could round robin on that. Yeah. Um, anyways, but, uh, you know, that deal is one where, um, uh, we were able to push rents. I think when we bought it, it was average rent was like, I want to say like eight or nine bucks and we're signing deals today and we've only owned it for 18 months, um, or less. And we just signed a 15,000 square footer at 1650. You know, that's, but it's urban and we added some murals and painted it and did landscaping, Still, but that's um, worth it. I know what was bringing, what, what I'm bringing <laughs> it up for is that our industrial brokers were like, what? And so it, it took a second for us to like get on the same cadence yeah. because it's like, you're asking them to like, all right, sell. Don't just, don't just show this to every industrial tenant that wants to come look at it. I want you to go target like the electric car companies. And they're like, why would I do that? That's way harder. Yeah. Um, but again, it's also we're both in the repositioning business for sure. Um, I have we have to be careful sometimes. Um, uh, the brand of the reposition can some you've got to be really careful that that doesn't become non accretive. Right. Like it's you get my point. But we're looking at we've seen a few things lately where like I think p- piercing the twenty dollar a foot number is yeah. not too far away, right. which is freaking it's nuts. nuts. Right. It's so nuts. And retail was like, you know, 20 to 24. And now it's like we're just seeing this blend, which again goes back to what we were talking about earlier, like this blend between industrial. But and it's retail. like what you just said. There are no other flex buildings or yeah. whatever in Brook Hollow. Yeah. And guess what? There's never going to be yeah, another right. one. Right. Yeah, exactly. This asset class, like you're not worried about the next one popping up. Well, and there's a deal that y'all just bought that we looked at too, similar type 
um, thought process that's up in um, Farmer's Branch, Addison area. Same same type of concept. Yeah. Um, and it's, you just, they're, now up there it's different because there's a lot of flex, which is different than Brook Hall. But my point being, they're still not making any more of it. Right. It's still highly urban. For sure. Um, we talked to equity a little bit. We don't have to talk much about this. I think it's, it's most people know what's going on, but uh, just like debt, mm -hmm. uh, any opinions besides rates are up, banks aren't lending as much, like anything that comes to mind? Oh, uh, I mean, there's, you know, I have some interesting, um, I have some interesting nuggets on it. You know, so yes, in general, um, you know, leverage is down substantially, whatever, you know, 55% is the, old 70% maybe 65% yeah. I mean um and I mean we had a deal just recently where it appraised wildly good where it was like a 50% LTV but we couldn't get near the loan we wanted to because we were constrained on the DSCR um that service coverage we're ratio. living in a DSCR CR world, world. Now. it's annoying um and so that's another thing that I think is a challenge you know we're used to not underwriting refis in our old analysis but we're gonna have to because you can't you really shouldn't live with 50% leverage and through a, you know, a five-year hold at any point. But anyways, um, on the debt side, um, so obviously seeing that, seeing um, probably you're seeing the same thing, a lot more conversation around recourse. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, I joined a, I joined a bank board. Um, I saw that. Which is, it's been interesting to see from the other side, um, you know, how, how those decisions are made slash, you know, as a borrower, we had been in a rising rate environment and so have the banks. Um, and I remember having discussions um, and we we're talking about, you know, on the borrower side, you know, when rates started moving, I remember we were all having the conversation, well, spreads will change. Spreads will come back in. So like the rate will, won't be quite so bad. And then, you know, I'm in the, in the meeting with a couple of my colleagues and they're like, spreads doesn't change. And on, on the banking side, and I'm like, no, guys, I'm telling you, as a representative of all borrowers, we think y'all are going to move spreads, you know? And it's like, it's just been interesting to to yeah. watch it and how they've adjusted to it. Um, And I do think also what is interesting, um, there are a lot of banks um, that, you know, have wanted really great borrowers that have not been able to get it in um, this very competitive market in DFW. And because there's so many lenders that are like, just no. Um, there's, uh, there's a tremendous opportunity for, um, a lot of really good banks to grow their business. But, you know, on the borrower side, if you're not like at this point, if you're not really focused on relationship lending and, you know, really playing that up, like you're doing yourself a disservice. Cause yeah. that's, I mean, that's basically how you're getting debt right now. Yep. It's a, it's a, it's a lender's market. The whole yeah. market right now is, it, it, I'm not saying don't get good deals. You got to get good deals. The name of the game right now is, can you get money? Yeah. There's gonna be a lot of people that get Period. great deal that can't get it's a dime to so fund it. It's so annoying. Yes, it's I know. It's a, can you get money? Yeah. And this is where- That's what we talk about more and more. But this is where the better companies grow and yeah. take market share. Because yeah. everything I'm hearing from the banks is, if they had five borrowers and maybe they, the, two of them were great, three of them might've been new, they're thinking, how do we give more to those two? Yeah, and yeah. how do we get these three, yeah. not off our balance yeah, sheet, but, but not lean into them. We're not yeah. leaning in. Yeah. And so like the money in downturns, whether it's equity and debt is going to accrue to the people that can prove yeah. that they can yeah. put it to work. And so, yeah, and you, really yeah, you got to find good, yourself. you got to have good deals for them to give you money, but yeah. there's going to be a lot of people out there that find good deals that won't be able to fund it. Yeah. This yeah. is an expensive yeah. endeavor. It is super expensive. Um, on that note, and there's a tremendous amount of resiliency factor that you have to have. Yeah. I mean, I've watched over the past 18 months, the amount of resiliency, um, you know, not just, not just for like me personally or in the company, but just, you know, from, from a real estate perspective overall with, um, so many people dealing with so many different things, yeah. um, and a lot more no's than they were used to receiving, you know, for the 18 months prior, um, you see how much resiliency is a competitive advantage. Yeah you know, and how much you won't like just sit on that. And somebody says no, and then you just sit there. Yeah. You know. All right. We've talked about industrial, but this, I actually haven't had as much of a talk with you on this even offline. And so I think this will be fun to talk about. I want to talk about the stockyards. Cool. So anybody listening to this, um, if you haven't figured out nothing but respect, these, uh, Susan didn't start in industrial. You started in adaptive reuse, like yeah. really complex shit. 
When I heard about the Stockyards Project many moons ago, I was like, no fucking way this thing's going to work. And it has turned out to be one of the coolest yeah, freaking cool. projects in yeah. Fort Worth. When I have guests come into town and they go stay down there, like it has yeah. kicked ass. So I want to like go deep into like how this all came about. Can you set the stage for what things were like before the project kicked off and before y'all got involved? Uh, just in general. So if you've been down to the stockyards, the stockyards is technically a, a district, a historic district. Um, and we, um, work for a partnership, um, of, a um, a guy named Ed Roski who owns a company called Majestic. And then, um, just a tiny little company. Yeah, just tiny, yeah, exactly. And then the Hickman family, um, and they own 77 acres. Um, the stockyards district itself, it includes obviously all of exchange, North, South, um, Joe T's every, everywhere. Anyways, and the district has been, um, over the past, it's seen revitalization and like ups and downs over the last like 30, 40 years. And, um, so when we got involved, which was in 2015, um, and obviously majestic, um, Hickman, Holt Hickman had been buying property there for years. Um, and then they ended up partnering with majestic. They had been there for a while. Um, when we got involved, um, you know, they they had all of the holdings, but it was basically in um, pretty much existing of what they had purchased and um, or, you know, basically contributed in. Um, and so the first project we did, what we call phase one is Mule Alley and Mule Alley, when we started, was literally um, 150,000 square feet in two barns um, that literally had horses and mules in them in a year before we broke ground. So up until um you know, literally a couple of years ago, that's where the horses and mules stayed. And then um, if you go down Mule Alley today, like the drive that you go down, that was a parking lot. Um, so it was just it, it was it was kind of a, a place of like yesteryear and a lot of like really good memories for people. But then other people, especially in the local community, were like, I never go there. Um, I was one of them. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, Jessica and I weren't that way, but that's not a surprise because Jessica and I are like, we can do it. You know, what were you hired to do? Um, we originally, we originally started, <laughs> we originally started, um, and you know me, I'm always like a yes, you know, yes to business type person. Uh, originally there was like one or two pads they wanted us to help them with like broker. And this is again, at the beginning of our company started in 2014. So this is our second year. And it was like me and Jessica and like, maybe we had an intern. Um, and they wanted us to help, um, like list some pads for like some retail users. And of course my, um, a uh, better half was like, you know, I want a, you know, a larger assignment than that. Anyways. Uh, so we started talking and then we were, we were basically engaged, um, for the, for the retail leasing, um, of Mule Alley over time, um, that morphed into obviously leasing for all of Mule Alley, but then, um, uh, overseeing, um, a lot of the branding, marketing, tenant build outs, just, like with anything, your role, you know, starts expanding. Um, and the way we're able to be successful is, uh, if you know my business partner, she can get like super obsessive and like really like throw herself into stuff. And so we made, I mean, I don't know, I can't, I don't know the count of unique deals that we made, but, you know, we basically had a wonder wall of tenants, you know, Stetson, you get the point, um, Stetson, Wrangler, like very specific tenants. And then a lot on the food and beverage side. Um, that you know didn't exist. They none of them existed. Um, and so most of the deals were cut, not with like a oh I'm you know head of retail for whatever, and I'm opening forty stores this year. It was like going to like literally the founder of Lou Casey or whatever it is. You get my point. Yep. Um, and so each deal was struck super uniquely, and it also points to the ownership there, which we're we're not in the ownership um at all there. Um, on the Majestic Hickman side, um, really wanted to make sure um, that phase one was a, su a success. And then phase one, as you know, is flanked by Hotel Drover, which is um, the number one um, autograph hotel in the world. Um, it's so awesome. It's so awesome. And that was um, who Jessica and I work for the most um, is um, a guy named Craig Cavalier and, and Kayla Wilkie that are at Majestic. And they literally, um, you know, design that like, you know, piece by piece, furniture, piece by furniture, piece, just, you know, everything. Um, and it shows. You, you, you already said it, but I'll just say it from my perspective. These old mule barns that nobody had walked inside or lived for 
decades. Yeah. Like we used to park there and just that was like a parking lot, yeah. like you said. Yeah, no, there's literally like shit inside, like actual shit, like the year before. Yeah. Yeah. How do you was it was it hard to sell people? Because again, even me, it's the stockyards. Nobody from Fort Worth goes to the stockyards. That's a tourist destination. Was it hard to sell tenants to come down there or like, how do you do that? Maybe it's not even stockyard related. How does somebody go from taking something that's been desolate to then turning this into like a momentum machine where tenants start signing up left and right? Well, we had some early believers. So like Tim Love's been down there for a long time. Um, and so w- when, once you get a couple of tenants that are they believe in the the message of it, then you can build off of it. Um and a lot of those type tenants, especially on the food and beverage side, they're they're creators like naturally. So they they see the vision as opposed to, um, you know, most people don't see it till it's there. And so, you know, if we led with that, um, we ended up with enough um, enough concepts that 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 we could send a signal that things are going to be very unique and interesting and different. Um, and so it actually the cell sounds to just which sounds terrible, but the sell was not that hard. I think it's sometimes easier to sell the dream than it is to sell, sell reality. Once reality kicks in, then you've got like, let me see your <laughs> historical data. And you're like, shoot, you know? Yeah. The difference with the stockyards is again, you know, back what we're talking about industrial and e-commerce when COVID happened, the stockyards um, phase one literally opened in the middle of COVID. Um, the demographic of person that goes to the stockyards does not give a fuck about COVID. And um, there was nowhere else to go and it was all outdoors. So um, it was obviously a scary time to grand open. But um, once we did it, um, we were met with, you know, oh, this is like the only place to go. So then it kind of like snowballed. Um, so the timing actually was perfect for when it opened. Um, and then at the same time, Fort Worth has been obviously changing and growing. And because of I mean, the drover, obviously, there's a lot of locals that go there for drinks and, you know, all that. Um, but because of a lot of the food and beverage that we have in Mule Alley, a lot of locals go there to hang out. And and so now you have, I mean, it is, it is the place to go out, quote unquote, if you're going to go out, which. It ain't West 7th anymore. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, that, that is the, it's not downtown. It's not West 7th. I mean, that's where it is. Will you please get hired to go redo downtown oh, so man. it can come back oh, to life? God. Downtown is a I freaking know. zombie land. God. It's, a, it's brutal is uh is the stock are, are, are you guys still involved in it and to my understanding like it's not over y'all have a lot more work to do this is a multi-decade yeah. project or yeah. like where does it stand today yeah so yes we're still involved um we are uh working right now with majestic hickman on their plans for phase two um okay. which you know at some point soon we'll be able to announce what those look like but it's going to be awesome and the challenge with when and if a phase two ever happens is um, now you have this obviously amazing historic district that has so many people love it. And then there was a, a very successful execution of phase one. You don't want to mess that up. So you can only do better than that, which is, um, you know, a tall order, uh, just given how successful phase one was. But we're excited about it. I mean, it's, it's it, that's one of those projects that you can work on for the rest of your life. And I hope I do, you know, I I. Uh, I just, it's been awesome. And I was not, um, I just didn't see it, um, on that. And I'm not trying to ask this in a, uh, like giving up private information. I just think it's something that you're going to see in a lot more cities and you're hearing it is you have this wonderful Fort Worth family, the Hickmans that have just been, they've been great for the city, um, in lots of ways, have this huge asset. And then they go to partner with somebody to develop it. How do those partnerships come together? And do you think this is like a trend that we'll see? Um, I have another friend, John Marsh, that that um, helps um, basically these wealthy families, these billionaire families that want to see their cities restored. They own this part of the city and they come cool. in and help them. He does that for a living. He does over two billion. He stewards over two billion across eight cities where literally it's becoming a thing where like these billionaires as a way to give back, they're going back to their hometowns and just like buying the whole thing. Yeah. And they're like, hey, let's do a 40 year project and bring this thing back to life. It's awesome. Do you think this from your perspective is the stockyards a one and done that you can't do it anywhere else in the country? Or are you seeing these type of multi-decade legacy projects becoming a thing that 
kind of like nostalgia. We're kind of that point where like we miss the old days. Yeah, I think I think it's it's extremely unique. However, um, I do think um, we will see more of these multi-decade type projects um, from the standpoint of. Um, the type of real estate that is, um, you know, I kind of look at it like, okay, you've got, you know, bronze and you've got silver and you've got gold and you've got diamonds, you know, that type of real estate. Um, and you're thinking about as a family investment and a legacy, uh, if you're going to invest in whatever, a number of different things, you know, they're not, they're never building that again. Yep. Um, and you know, the, the, the specialness that you can make of that place and all the memories and all that make it even more valuable, even more rare. So like from an investment standpoint, if you have the capacity to freaking do a, you know, multi-generational um, project like that, I mean, it's a really good investment as long as you're not worried about like turning capital and, you yeah. know, debt like the rest of us that have to figure things out like the, you know, old fashioned way. There's but, no five year performance. Right, there is not, you know. Um, so yes, I think, uh, that there is going to be more of a trend of that. It is rare because you have to have that wherewithal, which yeah. is hard. You know, for the Hickmans and Majestic, um, the Hick, um, uh, the Hickmans were very comfortable with Majestic, and so uh, the partnership, um, you know, from my understanding, was super easy because it was like if they were going to do it, this is who they were going to do it with. Yeah. Um. Which. Why. Um. Uh. Holt. Um. Uh. Brad's dad. Um. Was good friends with Ed, who okay. owned. Majestic. Majestic. Yeah. Got it. Um, and so maybe that relationship had been building for a long yeah. time before. It wasn't like yeah. they went out to market and said, exactly. pick you. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So there was a comfort level though, which goes back to the conversation we're having earlier about like themes on investors. You know, yeah. a lot is, a lot of decisions are made off of, you know, comfortability and, you know, personality, especially in like a family office type setting. Every dollar, a dollar is a dollar until it's attached to a person. Yeah. And then it's a dollar with a personality attached yeah. to it. Yeah, exactly. Money exactly. kind of magnifies your heart. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. So then they they partnered. Um, is this something like, again, the stockyards, is this something that y'all are seeking more of these big legacy projects? Or is it like, look, we're in Fort Worth, this one's good enough, and we're going to spend majority of our time buying industrial? Uh, I would say, um, you know, the way our company is set up, we've got investments and we've got advisory work. Advisory work is, you know, on the stockyard side and then, you know, development asset management, property management that kind of serve both those functions. Um, on the investment side, it's, you know, 85% industrial. I mean, yeah. um, just given, you know, it's nature, you know, we've got, you know, a small bucket, um, for really, um, unique, um, uh, but hopefully highly profitable mixed use projects. Um, but again, that's a very like small subset. It's not a volume game. Um, and then on the advisory side, you know, we'd love to do more um, projects like this. Um, this one is, you know, such a rare, it's rare for so many reasons. And then it's also in Fort Worth and Jessica and I, our whole team has so much like pride in it. So, you know, I'd love, we would love to do more of those projects. They just, they are super rare. Um, and so we wouldn't, we don't do advisory work, you know, for really not anything. not pitching it. Right, yeah. Okay, but I, and this, I, I think I should have tied this in more up front. You probably answered it, but I'm just going to ask it again. What was y'all's role in the project? Was it designing buildings? No. Uh, just tenanting buildings? Like, what was y'all's? It was it was um, tenanting the uh, tenanting Mule Alley, and then we helped a ton on um, uh, setting up like the vision, branding, et cetera, for like what it became and is, and then um, then ended up helping on like tenant build outs and stuff like that. But the actual development of it was done by uh, Majestic, um, and then they have in house an in house construction company called Commerce Construction, so they you know self GC it. Yeah, I remember um I, it's it's Jason Boso, I think, with Truck Yard. Yeah. He was gonna go to Crystal Springs and then uh, like years were going by, it wasn't happening. And he's like, I think I'm going to the stockyards project. And I was like, No, <laughs> do not go. I was there the other night. We had an event in Fort Worth in May and brought like three hundred people there and it was kick ass. There's um like I think that's the place like where the TCU kids go. Like I think yeah. it's like highly popular. Okay, now it's you you started that project you said 2015 is 2023 mm -hmm. like looking back on it now what's like the one or two biggest lessons you learned obviously it was a success 
there might be a phase two. You've said it could be exciting. Like, what do you go into that project with that you didn't have yet that took you had to learn throughout the first eight years of this one? Um, I'd say, I mean, this is, yeah, speaking for us, um, which, you know, if you know Jessica, you know, she's not really afraid mm-hmm. of anything. Um, but, you know, thinking about what the future could look like for um, the stockyards um, in like a phase two setting versus phase one. I mean, there was a lot of like, can we can we do it? Can we literally dream up what we want, you know, X concept to be and then go execute it and find it and convince somebody that doesn't even want to open a store that they should open a store. That was a lot of like the question asking on phase one. On phase two, we know we can do it and yeah. we have a, a a track record behind it to do it. So there's a lot more freedom in, I mean, it's fun when you think about um, when you're uh, in planning sessions, like what can it be? And literally it's, I've never been in, you know, meetings outside of whenever, you know, it's just me and Jessica really that we can like literally it's like what if we invented aliens you know you like there's so much (laughs) there's there's politicians trying to do it as we speak yeah right right, yeah exactly I got I got a text on it yesterday (laughs) but but you get my point like once you've seen oh you can do it you literally it allows like the planning process or the dreaming phase for the next phase literally be limitless which is really cool um on a project like that when it has i mean it's 9 million visitors a year it's insane it's more than we looked it up it's more than the eiffel tower that's so awesome yeah uh you 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 got to start your career under terry who's um one of the best placemakers at trademark uh you got to work on this you travel a lot mm-hmm. you enjoy you get your inspiration as you go how do projects like that like just even when money's not the constraint, just totally blow it. Like what, you, cause you walk around and see a lot of stuff these days that people are like, man, you spend a lot of money I mean, and yeah. this is garbage. Yeah. How can groups that have so much money create such bad places? Where does, what happens in the process that screws it all up? Uh, I mean, there's a couple of things. I mean, there's a ton of them. I'd say the biggest one is, you know, when like the, the non-cool person tries to be cool. Yeah. And you know, big, huge mixed use like projects like that. If you're not, if that's not like what you you live and breathe in the detail and the glitter and the layering and the, you know, how it makes you feel and what it smells like and you try to like fake it and you're not naturally that's how it is, you can feel it. Like we've, you know, as example, like Crockett Row. Yeah. Sorry. You know, I know we just bought, but <laughs> when I bought it. Um, <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, you can just feel it like there's just there's nothing there. Yeah. Um, second. Could there ever be something there? Could the, is there the right person? Like if y'all had bought it at the right price or is it if, if, once things are done? No, I done. always believe you can revitalize. I think it's, I think it is really hard to, to again, take something from something that has a stigma and turn it into something else versus taking something from nothing and turning it into something. I think yeah. that's actually easier. Um, I think that asset could do it, but I think the pricing is such like, you know, the multifamily anchors that deal. So then that you just never can get to a price that makes sense. Um, uh, For the other piece of it is, you know, really complex mixed use. Um, If you think about the stockyards or any of Terry's projects, example, like there's so much programming and layering and things happening there. And you have to have your game face on that. That's what you want to do. I mean, it is it's not like operating an industrial, you know, single tenant deal. I mean, you're I mean, I don't know how many employees, you know, stockyards heritage owns or uh, so I don't know how many employees Stockyard Heritage has that literally from like gunfighters to, you know, marketing people. I mean, just stuff that you wouldn't even think about. The amount of layering you have to do on a programming basis is if you don't do that, then it doesn't feel alive. Um, yeah. So that's number two. And then number three is if you don't have the wherewithal, it's extremely expensive to keep all that stuff up. Yeah. Um, so you're basically running a property. It's an opco. You're managing tenants, and then you have like a hospitality yeah, company that's exactly. managing it all. Do the tenants pay in as like an HOA f- budget? Marketing, to the, yeah, the top? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a marketing fee. Um, and then the, I'd say the last thing is if you, if you, you know, because Jessica and I have done some obviously mixed use projects where there's been a substantial com- uh, place making component, i.e., like Foundry as an example. Yeah. Um, you know, that's one of those things. If you're not, you know. Billy benefactor or whatever. I mean, you got to <laughs> you got to get in there, redo it, 
put the energy into it yeah. and then you got to you got to sell it because it's expensive to maintain it. Um, and then the last piece I would say is that and it's dangerous. Um, a lot of those districts stay alive because of the personalities that are in them. Yeah. And if you start losing those personalities or somebody sells and then it's bought by an institution or whatever, and the in institutions, they don't think about it because I'm definitely not going to tell them, but they're making a big bet that they can they can manufacture what somebody has made it their life to have be, you know, their baby, you know. Yeah. And when those things start going away, like it just stops feeling as special. Right. And then then it's literally like just a regular old uber expensive mixed use deal that you know, nobody can afford and nobody wants to go to the tenants because it feels dead. What happens in a situation where you've probably run into this before? You have this tenant that's been there 20, 30 years. It's like what you just yeah. said. They're the life of the party. Yeah. Like they're the soul, the heartbeat. Yeah. And they've and they they've been there forever. Maybe they have low rents or maybe they're in an old lease. But the truth is, like, they're never going to be able to pay the top, like what you yeah. could bring somebody else yeah. in for. Do great developers know leave that tenant in at a lower basis and make it up elsewhere? Or do you punt that person out and or group out and backfill it and hope to God it works, even though you might have doubled rents? I think they do now. Um, again, even in our little span of the last six or seven years. Um, you know, when we started, when I cut my teeth in mixed use, you know, retail was, yeah, while multifamily was obviously, you know, highly profitable, um, you had a ton of capital that was interested in just the retail component of it. Cause you could actually get, you know, all right, 30, $40 rents, um, uh, super successful, um, tenants. And then um, it shifted to where now retail has turned into basically the amenity base for the other uses. And so what that means is that a lot of developers have picked up on now. It doesn't matter whether or not, you know, so-and-so is going to produce. I mean, I don't, you know, my retail friends like earmuffs, you know, sorry when I asked for a real rent, but, um, <laughs> but <laughs> earmuffs, <laughs> earmuffs. Um, uh, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. You're, 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 they're there for the amenity and what they provide everything else. Now, the challenge becomes when you like buy street retail, like we've expanded into Austin. So we've been um, more willing to look at street retail, which is something we did obviously a long time retail? ago, like South Congress yeah. stuff. Um, you know, those that's a little bit different, a, a little bit of a different animal because you're buying like little standalone buildings at whatever crazy price per square foot. Even if you love the guy and he's been there for 20 or 30 years, but he's paying five bucks, you're like, you man, go. you can't. Yeah. It depends on the size of the project and the size of the tenant. Yeah. But I mean, you saw it happen with like the original on Camp Bowie. Yeah. Like, damn. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. I that really want to, I want to know that story a little bit more. I know. Well, I only, I, do you have any idea what the Hudson House comp was across the street? You kick out a nursery and then bring in one of the top oh, restaurants God. in Dallas. I'm sure. I do, that but I'd make it up. It's not in my head that anymore. That building owner is, you know, there's no way that uh, the nursery was paying anywhere close oh, to what a no. restaurant could pay. That's, uh, that's going to open soon, I think. Yeah. By the way. All right, Suze. Thank you so much for today. This is great as always. You're welcome. I Thank appreciate you. it.